Hey everyone, welcome to Signal Processing with Paul. In this video, what I want to do is talk about the relationship between the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. Now, when I write them both together, and here's just a standard Fourier transform of a function x of t going to x of f, and I write the Laplace transform, and notice how this is the bilateral Laplace transform, so this is going from minus infinity to positive infinity. Um, if you look at them and you kind of squint your eyes, you see something that looks very similar. You have an integral from minus infinity to infinity of some function times an exponential to minus some value times the val times some variable that you're integrating over. In our case, it's going to be t in both cases. And this is really apparent when I write the Fourier transform in terms of angular frequency. So one way we can write it is x of omega equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of t e to the minus j omega t dt. Now, this is just the same as doing a u substitution, and then you have some scaling with the, the, the 2 pi part, but that doesn't really matter too much as long as you get the forward and reverse transforms to cancel each other out. So this is usually what we write it, and then the 1 over 2 pi is in the inverse transform, but that's neither here nor there for this. If you look at this, um, now this looks really, really similar. And the, the thing to notice is in the Fourier transform, we're taking a function of a real variable, so t is a real variable, and we're returning a function of a real variable. Now, x of f may be complex valued at each, evaluated at each frequency, but each f that you, when you, you get is actually a real valued f. There's no, you know, imaginary frequency. You have positive and negative frequency, but you know, it's still a real valued frequency. And of course, same with time. You don't have um, imaginary time, but you have positive and negative time. Now, in the case of the Laplace transform, we are still taking t as a real valued function. But notice here that this s is actually a complex valued function. So s is going to equal a plus j omega. And I'm, you know, you could do a plus bj, but I'm using omega here not to be not be crass, but because hopefully, and you kind of see where this is going, um, where, where there's a reason we're using omega here, and this is this will become apparent in a moment. So your Laplace transform actually is a function of two variables because a complex number is actually not a real number. It's a collection of two real numbers. It's basically an R2. It's a two-dimensional, you can think of it as a two-dimensional vector in, in many ways. So as a result, when we plot the Laplace transform of a function, what you get is you have an s plane. You're going to have, this is going to be minus a, and this is going to be plus a, and this is going to be plus omega, and this is going to be minus omega. And what you basically see here is some, some kind of surface. So maybe it has some like top part and some bottom part. You can draw like these kind of contours. You have, you basically have this, this three-dimensional surface. It can be kind of lumpy. It can have like, like, you know, tent poles and stuff going down. It can have all sorts of things. It's a surface. And if you imagine this as I like to think of it, like the, like a loaf of bread, maybe that's been, you know, at, you know, around in the grocery bag with the rest of your groceries, you can think of the Fourier transform as basically the, the slice of bread along the imaginary axis of the S-plane. So imagine if I was to basically take, this isn't a great drawing, but I was to take basically whatever this, whatever the, the, the basically, which, what you're seeing here is, this is the omega axis, and what's coming out is a certain function. And if I was to take that function, and I was to basically take this end and put it over here, so this is minus omega, and this would be plus omega, and what I would see would be some, some function that basically is now just a two-dimensional slice. So you have left and right, up and down, rather than going in up, down, left, right, back and forth kind of thing. So this is now a two-dimensional function that is just a slice of the S-plane. And that's exactly what's going on. If you take the Laplace transform, and you evaluate this, well actually, let's actually expand this. So the Laplace transform of x of t is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, and this is just substituting in a plus j omega, x of t e to the minus a plus j omega times t dt. We can do this, you know, we're not 
by doing anything. But let me evaluate this at a equals zero. So rather than looking at one variable, we're just setting a to be zero. So that's this part. And now we can look at, a, at what happens as we can vary w. And what you get out of this, it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And as you can see, this here is just the Fourier transform in its angular sense. And we can go from angular sense by basically substituting in 2 pi f, which is just going to sort of, um, if you, we plot it in terms of f, it's going to kind of squish everything together. But we usually do that because there's pretty much always a 2 pi there. You can thank Euler and all these people for that. But uh, hopefully this video shows the relationship between the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. There's a similar relationship between the discrete time Fourier transform and the Z transform, which we'll look at perhaps in another video. But hopefully this video gives you an intuition as to what's actually going on when you are taking the Laplace transform or the Fourier transform. As long as the Fourier, as long as the J omega axis is contained within the region of convergence of your Laplace transform, evaluating your Laplace transform at when the real part is zero is just the same as taking the Fourier transform. And that's because the Laplace transform is the S is, a, is two variables, and that also explains why when you take the inverse Laplace transform, you have to have a line or a path integral, because once again, you're, you're now integrating with respect to S, which is, two, which is a two-valued function. So hopefully this is clear. Hopefully uh, this gave you a little bit more intuition. And like I said, I'll also do a similar video for the Z transform and the DTFT. So thanks for watching.